All right. Well, it's two o'clock, so let's get started. Uh, this is the part nine of the uh, summit on the future of Vermont, and part nine's language is Vermonters must renew civic engagement and strengthen trust, civility, community connection, democratic decision-making, and empower new leaders. So it's a massive, massive uh, focal point as part of the summit. My name is Meg Mott. Uh, I used to teach politics and law at one of those small liberal arts colleges that's no longer with us. Um, and I am also town moderator for the town of Putney. And uh, we have four fantastic panelists here who come from a variety of positions, uh, who have experience in town governance, in state politics, in, um, and so we'll be able to hear from these four panelists as we wrestle with an angle having to do with civic engagement, strengthening trust, civility, community connection, democratic decision making, and empowering new leaders. Uh, this ma machine that you're using right now has a special feature. I just wanted everyone in the audience to know about that. And that is you can, on the bottom of your screen, if you want closed captioning, that is available. You just look for that. Uh, if you have any difficulties, let Alyssa know in the chat feature. Uh, but that is available for everybody on this call. So we have four panelists. I'm going to introduce them and then pose a question. As Paul Costello mentioned in the opening remarks and uh, Jenna also talked, uh, talked about this, we're using something called the fishbowl method, which means that uh, I'll ask a question of our panelists and they'll have about four minutes to answer. We're going to go around in a circle. Uh, and then after they've each spoken, we'll go around a second time because that's sometimes where new ideas come about, where the panelists are really able to think about what each other is saying. Uh, and then I'm gonna have a second question for them. Uh, and at that point, we should be, my guess is at around the three o'clock hour and it, uh, I'll open it up for Q and A. So I wanna give the panelists a lot of space uh, this afternoon to be able to speak with each other. Uh, because I know they have important things to say. So our four panelists are Susan Clark, who is the co-author of two books, uh, Slow Democracy, and also All Those in Favor. Uh, Susan is the town moderator of Middlesex. And uh, speaking as a moderator, she is the go-to person for all of us moderators around the state of Vermont to get a sense of what it is that we're doing and how we can up our game. Uh, we also have Lucy Rogers, who was elected to the Vermont House when she was 23 years old. Uh, and she is, besides being a Vermont rep, she is also uh, works at LSF, which is a forest products um, um, business. We also have James Jameson Davis, who is just finishing up Vermont Law School. I believe this week is perhaps the final week, really coming to the end of a three-year process to get his JD. He was a former Hartford Select person and uh, served a two-year term. So he's able to see things from both angles, from within the town, and also somebody who's thinking a lot about law and politics and inclusion in Vermont. And finally, we have Christopher Kaufman Ilstrup, the executive director of the Vermont Humanities Council. Uh, Christopher put together a grant from the Mellon Foundation this past spring. It's when I first met Christopher to get us thinking more about civics and how we can collaborate to improve um, all the things that are in part nine of the um, Vermont. I keep forgetting what it's called. It's not, it's called the Vermont Prospect, no, Project Proposition. Proposition, thank you very much. The Vermont Proposition, okay. So here's the first question, and it's kind of a wonky question, but so many of you have uh, experience with the day-to-day -day of politics. So my question to you all is, and again, feel free if you want to uh, interpret this in the way that, in, uh, take it in the direction you want to, 
How do you see the relationship between local governance and state policy? So we're going to begin with Susan, and then we'll um, I'll call on uh, each one of you. Susan Clark. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for thanks for this this uh, chance to exchange ideas. I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. I'm really excited about that lead statement. You know, I'm all about renewing civic engagement and all of those things that, that are uh, on the wall behind Meg there. Um, and I don't disagree with the long version either. I'm, I'm especially supportive of the, the focus on education and, and um, they kind of uh, honed in on reducing stigma in vocational education. Um, and that kind of brought to mind for me, there's a recent book by David Goodhart called um, Head, Hand, Heart, where he talks about an increasing imbalance in our uh, society between sort of what he calls the cognitive elite, um, uh, the head class, um, and people in the trades and caregiving professions who do the, the hand and heart work. And, um, you know, it's, it's an imbalance in, in what we earn, but also in dignity and respect. Um, and this stigma is part of kind of an unspoken kind of simmering tension, I think, in a lot of our rural communities that um, just exacerbates that historic, you know, two Vermonts divide mm -hmm. among communitarian place-based Vermonters and, and, a, and a more what you might call cosmopolitan elite. Um, so that's where it that's where it connects with democracy. Uh, you know, we, we need both of these populations. It, you know, we're going to grow, we're going to change, and we also need to understand that these rural values and worldviews um, are real and they're not going away. Uh, so enhancing respect and opportunity for all Vermonters, I think, is going to be critical to that to, mm -hmm. to that trust and civility that we need. But there are also some key elements, I thought, that um, we really that needed to be boosted in, in the, uh, the proposition. Um, you know, I think there's one single sentence that says, you know, talks about empowering uh, leaders to uh, develop engagement opportunities. To me, that is where the rubber hits the road. That is what we, what we need to expand. And, you know, since you asked my opinion, uh, you know, I would say that there are three key elements, uh, you know, to local to good local democracy, and, and they are inclusion, deliberation, and power. We need those three key elements, and by inclusion, I don't just mean we're each represented. Um, we, we all need to be invited to participate. And by deliberation, I don't just mean talking. Uh, you know, there's some really rigorous, wonderful uh, research uh, that, that really talks about how important it is to have great, solid information to, to base our discussions on, to have the opportunity to weigh options um, and really look at the pluses and minuses um, of, of, uh, of different options and then create solutions together. So, so deliberation isn't A versus B, it's let's co-create C. Um, and then power, um, meaning that these decisions we make locally need uh, not just to be advisory, um, but have a clear link to change. And, you know, the research on, uh, you know, especially in today's complex system, the research is really clear. You know, we all know the internet has changed everything, right? It has changed people's expectations um, about engagement. And, uh, you know, that sort of old style command and control, statewide mandates, top-down models, these are not what are working for our populations today. State policies, um, I think, need to be facilitated, um, especially given our you know, wicked, wicked problems in 21st century. Um, we need to be designed, I think, less like a hierarchy and more like a wiki. Uh, uh, you know, whether it's the environment or economic development or education or other social issues, I think the state's role needs to be to set firm standards uh, and then support communities and meeting them in their own unique ways. So encouraging communities to innovate um, and then uh, the state can facilitate information sharing and collaboration. So Great. we want to renew people's trust, I think, in, in civic engagement, we need, we need to trust them. Wow. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, we are now going to move to Jameson. What do you have to say about uh, what Susan offered or what are you thinking in terms of state responsibilities to improve local governance? Yes, thank you. First and foremost, uh, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for the opportunity to be on this you know, great panel with you all and to be able to have this conversation. Um, so, you know, my feelings when it comes to the relationship between local governance and state policy is one that I think really depends on a, on a number of factors. 
right? So I think the factors that really kind of, you know, set the tone for the relationship between the two is understanding what are the processes and procedures within that state. Um, and how those play a role in the ability for the two governments to work together, um, or if it creates some type of adversary type of relationship based on just the rules itself, right? So for example, Vermont being a Dillon rule state, and Dillon rule is a principle that local governance um, can only really exercise uh, powers expressly granted to them by the state. And, you know, these powers necessarily are, um, you know, are, they're necessarily and, and fairly implied um, from the grant of power and powers that are crucial to the existence of local governance, right? But the Dillon rule jurisdictions typically have a narrow set of powers in which that they are allowed to maneuver in that space to create, you know, ordinances and things of that nature to protect their, their constituents and community members. Um, you know, the cons that I believe that evolved from the Dillon rule uh, which is again what we are under in Vermont, is that it prevents local communities from quickly being able to react to the, to the local issues. There are things, especially in a place like Vermont, um, where you know an issue in the town of Hartford might be a different issue in the town of Rutland. It might be a different issue in you know Colchester. Or it might be a different issue in the Northeast Kingdom. And so the inability of the community and the local the elected officials to be able to uh, precisely and um, you know, have an impact almost immediate as possible on their community members, I think is one that uh, really harms, you know, Vermont and Vermont's ability to handle some of the situations, especially now in the situations that are around and, and that can be addressed through racial, social, and environmental injustices that we are now, uh, you know, acknowledging and eliminating certain factors. Um, you know, other cons from the Dillon rule that I think play a role is that, you know, local governments need to have this ability to impact, you know, their culture, right? Their way of life, the quality of life um, of their citizens, especially when it comes to the issues that are highly contentious. And so, you know, um, the inability for them to, to do that if it's not within that, that narrow set of powers that was given to them expressly through the state, I think has a huge impact on on the local elected officials' ability to have an impact on, on that immediate culture and that quality of life of their citizens. And then, you know, then, then there's, you know, this, this possibility that's out there, right, where there's state legislators uh, may be able to punish local elected officials, you know, from deviating from state requirements, uh, you know, by threatening to withhold state funds, um, for not being compliant, you know, towns and cities, or to threaten to remove, um, you know, some elected lo local officials, or even campaign against them, uh, because of the fact that they are trying to uh, potentially move something forward that you know uh, may push the boundaries in terms of what their uh, ability is to do something within that jurisdiction based on the Dillon Rule. Um, and I think all these play a role and play a factor in the ability to to the local elected officials, whether it be select board or whatever you know the structure be in your in your in your community to have an impact on your quality of life and what it is that you deem important as a community to be able to you know, protect the most vulnerable individuals in your community, um, whoever that might be, that might identify, because it's different in each community. Um, but I think you know, that kind of dynamic is uh, really a, a, a potential role play in the ability in terms of how you know, state uh, le uh, legislators or elected officials interact and communicate with the local elected officials. Wow, great. Thank you very much, Jameson. And for uh, explaining to us about the Dillon Rule and, and how that does constrain what uh, town governments can do. Uh, great. We're now going to turn to Christopher. Uh, what do you have to say about this issue or you know, thinking about what the other two have just said? Yeah, thank you so much, Meg. And, and uh, you know, thank you also to the Vermont Council on Rural Development for organizing these conversations and organizing the proposition work as a whole. I know this is a big culminating event, but there's many thousands of hours of organizing that went into, into getting us to this point um, and presenting us with these 10 conversations to think about. Um, you know, I come at this uh, as a, from a slightly different perspective, perhaps more as a, a community organizer, as a cultural organizer. Um, and so I'm thinking, you know, often when I think about participation and engagement, either at the state level or the local level, I'm thinking about it less as a matter of governance or, uh, or legal ramifications, but more as a matter of community building and community development. Um, 
And so when, when I'm thinking about this, this intersection between the state um, and the local communities, I'm often reminded of a lot of the work that I did up in the Northeast Kingdom over the last 15 to 20 years, really, um, where it was most often set up as an oppositional relationship between Montpelier and local small communities up in the, up in the Northeast. And I, and I know in other parts of Vermont as well, um, that it, it felt like to many people from my time as a farm organizer, uh, through my, my work at the Community Foundation, um, as though Montpelier was forgetting about small towns um, and forgetting about the people who lived in them and setting up policies that were actively harmful in many ways or structures that were actively harmful in many ways. Uh, and you can kind of look at the, the long history of battles, for example, around education funding mm -hmm. as, as just one um, example of how that tension between uh, a strong state government and the needs of, of local kids in that case um, really were not in harmony um, and probably still aren't to this day. Um, many local communities in the Northeast Kingdom have fought hard to keep their small schools open um, to really with, without any uh, or very little understanding um, from the state government in, in Montpelier about why people might want to have a strong central school in their community, uh, why it's important for them to have a place to gather um, beyond issues of governance, right? We, I mean, we know that a lot of town meetings happen in, in local schools, uh, but a lot of other things happen in local schools too, right? That is where public art is created, uh, that, is, that, is, that is where uh, many community meetings are held. That is where many community suppers are held. held. And when you lose that, that kind of town center, uh, which the school represents um, for many of our smallest towns and villages, you really lose a, a tremendous amount of cohesion and social capital. And so I, th I think that conversation alone um, really shows the kind of distrust and the break that can that can happen between a strong state government and a local a local community government, and we really need to ponder how to repair that harm going forward. Right. Thank you very much, Christopher, for bringing that other perspective uh, into this discussion. Uh, Representative Lucy Rogers, what are you thinking at this point about the relationship between Montpelier and small towns? Uh, and um, yeah, what other people have said. Well, thank you, Meg, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I feel really privileged to go last on this question because I think everything that I have to say um, builds on what my fellow panelists have kind of set up. And as a representative in state government, um, I've put a lot of thought into kind of sitting on the other side of this issue and how do we, in state government, um, build the trust to be able to be seen as a force that isn't antagonistic to um, local local empowerment is the term I use. It's it's local control, but I think it's more than local control. It's local empowerment. And I I love Susan's um, line of by deliberation I don't just mean talking. And I think this is kind of the the equivalent by local control. I don't just mean handing over power. I mean empowering, which is different there. Um, so I, I, to, I guess to start off, I read this title of section nine and I just felt like I had this aha moment of this is it, you know, we are renewing civic engagement, strengthening trust, civility, community connection, democratic decision-making and empowering new leaders. To me, this is, this is a, a paradigm shift. And I think, um, whereas I don't disagree with anything in the longer explanation, I think it's a little bigger than, than what was there. I think. Mm -hmm what we're really looking for is that trust. To me, that's the crux of everything because once you build the trust, then the rest of our charge in section nine can follow. And the important piece in understanding trust is understanding that trust has to be a two-way relationship. So, you know, I think in state government, there's kind of this narrative of like, how do we get people to trust us? How do we build trust? And sometimes the way you build trust is you start by trusting. and and this is, this is in line with what the other panelists have said, but I thought it could be helpful to bring um, a specific example to mm. the people. And 
and and it's about education equity so it's been set up a little bit by both Susan and Christopher but um one issue that I've been working on in the legislature is is equalized pupil counts so in other words we have an education funding formula that gives each school a certain amount of taxing capacity which roughly translates into a certain amount of school funding based on the number of students but it's not just based on the number of students it's also in recognition that some students cost a different amount in order to provide the same opportunities. Um, and the legislature commissioned a study that showed that our, our, our formula that has basically been in existence for many decades and came out of political compromise but no real fact-based research is completely wrong. So we right now pay, I think about, you know, 1.2 times as much to educate a student living in poverty if a student not living in poverty is one and it should be four. So we're talking like multiple times off and the, the main um, categories of students that, have been, that are being underfunded are students living in poverty, um, students in rural small schools and English language learning students, which in Vermont is a, is a large portion of our people of color, of the community of people of color. And so, so throughout this conversation of trying, now that we have the information, trying to um, equalize Free equity in the way we fund education in the state. This question that's come up a lot is like, well, how do we trust these districts? You know, if a district that's almost entirely students in poverty now has four times the capacity to pay for education, how do we trust that it will be using this extra cost capacity responsibly? And you know, how do we put in um, guardrails and regulations to ensure that these districts that have lots higher than average people, um, English language learners. Um, rural communities, poor communities, that they're using this capacity um, correctly. And for me, as someone who represents a rural community with a high poverty and who was born in and grew up in this community, who attended public school in this community, this is so deeply offensive because what we're saying is if we create an equitable system, how do we ensure that the, the economically disadvantaged, the English language learner and the um, rural communities are using their their money effectively when nobody's asking to put those guardrails in place for the other communities and mm. in fact in our current system the communities that are not english language learner not rural and not economically disadvantaged have far more taxing capacity than they should under an equitable system and nobody has ever gone to those communities and asked them you know how do we ensure that you're using this extra money that you really shouldn't necessarily be getting mm -hmm. fairly and in a responsible way. So, so to me, I, you know, people always ask me as I'm a Democrat too, so I'm a rural Democrat, and people always ask me, you know, how do we get more trust from our rural communities? And I say, you know, well, why don't you start by trusting our rural communities? <laughs> and I think I probably used my, my time for the first round. Um, yeah. But, but right. I think, you know, just, just to, to close by saying people realize right like people pick up on this mm -hmm. and and so a part of that trust too is recognizing that that people are tuned in and people do notice subtle questions such as legislators mistrusting use of money in certain communities and not in others and this kind of this trust building isn't something that needs to happen with equal effort across the board it's something that needs to happen with specific targeted effort and respect for the reasons why there might be mistrust to begin with with certain communities in the state government. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Lucy. I see a, a lot of nodding heads uh, for what you just said. So for those who just joined this, uh, this session, uh, we will be taking questions uh, at the very end, but I wanna give the panelists, because those were four uh, important statements that were made about establishing trust between small towns and the state and all the nuances. So let's turn back again. Uh, we're gonna go in the same order. Susan, having heard the all this rich conversation, what are you thinking now? That was super powerful. I really appreciated all of these uh, and I learned something from each of you. And um, boy, uh, really, really value um, the, 
the role of this conversation at this moment, um, because I, I, I think that it, it, it really resonates with a lot of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, and a couple of things come to mind. One of them, this is really reinforces one of the things um, that, that I think each of you was saying. Um, uh, there's been a, a lot of research on um, Vermont's town meeting tradition. Um, you know, we have a, a rich tradition of, of local democracy. And so when we ask ourselves, how can we, you know, enrich our democracy? How can we people uh, get people more engaged? Um, um, I think looking at that data uh, can inform us, and it is very much in keeping with with um, you know what we just heard. Um, I think one of the things that um, most surprised people uh, when when Frank Bryan, UVM professor Frank Bryan, came out with his data was um, political scientists were really surprised to hear that uh, Vermonters um, are very willing to. Uh, engage in gnarly, difficult issues and do so in a, a, a civilized way. Political scientists just assume that everybody hates controversy because um, that is generally the trend. But if you look at town meeting data, you know, meetings will kind of go along with sort of medium attendance and then one year attendance will jump like crazy. And when we peel back the veil and, and look at why, it's because there's a big decision that's going to be made there. And one of the key findings um, is that um, power matters. Um, if you invite people to come to a meeting just to kind of yell at each other, uh, yeah, the Americans you know, will stay home, of course, of course. Uh, but what, what we find is that we have plenty of time um, for hard, difficult conversations if there's going to be a meaningful decision made there and people have the decision-making power. If you consistently hold meetings where people's participation is not going to have an impact on the outcome, uh, you know, it's not surprising that Vermonters find better things to do. Um, so I, I think that's, that's, you know, one thing that, that came to mind. And I think another thing I would just add um, is that we need to, uh, th there's been a lot of emphasis on efficiency, um, efficiency and speed. Um, uh, and I think we need to just accept that democracy is often messy. Um, and it often comes, uh, you know, the trade-off is going to be that it comes at a cost of you know of on, on short term speed and efficiency long long run that that uh, if if you invest in that deliberation and, and democracy at the beginning it it makes the decisions more sustainable so it actually is a good investment it's not that we're wasting time um, it often also results in a lack of uniformity you know my town might do things a little bit different. Uh, from yours, but uh, you know, as Jameson pointed out, that you know that that's healthy. That's that's how ecosystems, you know, change and thrive. So, um, I think we need to uh, need to raise up those qualities as as being good things and not risks. Great, thank you, Susan. Uh, and you just clarified why you said inclus inclusion, deliberation, power. Why that sequence needs to go in that order, um, and that making real decisions uh, that matter is key to this. Jameson, what are you thinking now having heard the first round? Yeah, again, you know, I echo uh, Susan and, you know, just being blown away by the rich conversation that we've had so far. Um, and I do kind of want to just pick up a little bit where uh, Representative Rogers kind of had a discussion in terms of trust. And I think that's a very important conversation that we need to have here um, in understanding that, you know, when it comes to trust and gaining trust, especially from community members, and you know, uh, I would emphasize those uh, vulnerable and and those uh, who come from the global majority, who some consider to be minorities. Um, you know, I, I would encourage individuals to educate themselves on why there might be distrust in the first place. Okay, um, how can you acknowledge and be compassionate to those who suffer from? intergenerational trauma, you know, and that, in, in, excuse me, in, intergenerational trauma being based on very relevant and legitimate reasons, uh, you know, from our nefarious past, right? Um, and so, for example, uh, Lucy did, did an awesome job of giving an example, so I would try to piggyback off of her, and mm -hmm. that, you know, prior to what we've all been exposed to in the last year, year and a half, uh, due to the racial, social, and environmental social uprising, you would find in communities all across America, um, especially in communities all across Vermont in particular, that you know individuals would voice their opinions in terms of how the interaction between them and maybe police might be, how the interaction between them and the local governance might be, how the interaction between them and local businesses might be. Um, and too often what happens is that when individuals and people of color and the marginalized get 
the confidence to speak up. What they are met with is, oh, bring me some data to back that up. Mm -hmm. You know, bring me something to show that what it is that you're going through is legitimate. Mm -hmm. And what that does is a n n number of things, right? We don't have the time. That can be a, a, a hour session just on its own as far as what it creates. Um, but at the end of the day, it completely doesn't doesn't open up any any you know avenues for trust between individuals. Uh, if you're asking me for data on something that's going to take two years to collect data, now you're telling me that I need to go two more years of my you know bad experiences, my trauma, uh, going through microaggressions, micro invalidations, whatever the the exposure may be, in order for you to get some information that I already know is right, for you to be able to get to a point where you're just now believing what I'm saying, right? And so that's one factor. Um, I do want to shift a little bit and talk a little bit about the proposition. Um, I love the title and I think the title spoke numerous of ways. Uh, but to, to be honest, for me, after the title, it lost a little bit of its flair. Um, you know, I think the, the, the part nine is a little bit too, too narrowly focused on like vocational studies and just education. Um, I think there needs to be an emphasis on like the the importance of relatability amongst community community members and how they relate and interact with one another. Um, you know, town meetings, I think because they are so important to Vermont culture, I think they need to be brave spaces, right? And so what I mean by that is that they need to be environments that allow individuals to engage with one another over conversational issues, you know, like race and diversity and social justice and honesty and sensitivity and all these aspects that make up our culture. Um, you know, the intention of these meetings need to be, uh, need to help kind of reassure that the individuals who go to these meetings and feel anxious about sharing their feelings and their thoughts, um, you know, leave their feeling more, more valuable than, than what they thought, right, when, when they were going. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the parts of, of, of schools and the emphasis on schools, I understand that and I'm all for that. But I do think there needs to be an acknowledgement of where the schools themselves need to go through a lot of growth, right? In the sense of uh, identifying and eliminating equitable, pra equitable practices that tend to create, you know, prejudicial or desperate outcomes for students based on their social culture uh, factors, you know, such as race and class and gender, religion and, and gender identity, things of that nature. Uh, I think schools as a whole, we need to do a better job of promoting teachings that examine the legacy of white supremacy, you know, superiority and privilege. Uh, we need to acknowledge the violence, disenfranchisement, and you know, potential generational trauma that may come, uh, that may, might become unearthed during certain type of teachings and certain type of educational topics that are being taught. Um, you know, I, I think there needs to be like a purposeful culture developed, you know, where you can promote these brave spaces that I talked about earlier, inclusive studies, right? Where you incorporate classroom content and strategies that, you know, cover a variety of, of topics and, and diverse, you know, ethnic and social groups. Professional development, I think, is huge. You know, being able to train teachers uh, on how to deal with, you know, instances immediately when it happens in class. And then just the, kind of this collective accountability as, as a community, right? Um, I think there needs to be a, an emphasis on public participation. I think that is huge. Public participation is something that really needs, uh, you know, to be emphasized in terms of the inaccessibility. You know, we as a community, as a Vermont, as a state, and at the local level, we need to meet individuals where they are. Um, instead of requiring them to come to us, right? Great, great, um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and then, you know, just to kind of finish up really quickly, I just do want to say that there's this lack of, of meaningful involvement as well. And so participants, you know, oftentimes when they do get the courage to go to these meetings, um, you know, they oftentimes feel as if though, you know, their participation is something in the past, right? And, and they feel as almost as if, as if they're being almost tokenized uh, for their experience, you know, like decisions are made previously to the meetings and then it comes to the meetings and they learn all these things about what has already been decided and never had an opportunity to actually be involved in. And then they wonder whether their partic participation is actually being incorporated when, you know, the things are happening behind the scenes. And so, you know, to sum all up, these are all things that I, I, I think, you know, uh, are topics that, you know, we, we as Vermonters need to have a, a broader kind of uh, understanding of, of, of why it creates this, this distrust. 
Yeah, thank you, Jameson. I so appreciate this notion. Town meeting is brave space. Like, let's really be there. And you also reinforce that notion that when people are there and offering their viewpoint, they're part of the decision making process, uh, not just receiving what's already been decided. So thank you so much. Uh, we're now going to move to Christopher. What are you thinking, having heard everybody? Oops, you'll need to unmute yourself. Sorry. You'd think That's after okay. 14 months, we'd be better at this. Um, I just want to, you know, I want to cheer on Jameson. Everything that you said totally resonates with me. Um, you know, and as, as, a, as a longtime queer activist in Vermont, um, you know, I, I experienced that, um, that exclusion, that feeling of, of not being heard all the time. Um, and so I, I really um, want to applaud you for talking about that and talking about um, the need for brave spaces that are much more inclusive. I would add to that, um, that, that folks, especially white folks and straight folks need to be willing to be uncomfortable um, in these spaces um, and to really create a different kind of environment um, to truly become a more inclusive um, community. And, you know, we often say like, how do we bring more people to the table? Well, maybe it's actually different tables that we need to be at. Uh, maybe it's it's not the same tables. Uh, maybe we actually need to be uh, to be building new tables to be in different kinds of neighborhoods, to be talking to different kinds of people. Um, I, I want to go right back to what Susan said at the beginning, though. I love the the metaphor of of, um, of um, heart, uh, hands, and uh, head, and recognizing that you know everybody in this room is really we're really head people, right? And we have the privilege to be here in this space. Um, and a lot of the, the heart and the hands people do not have the privilege to be here at 2.30 in the afternoon on a, on a work day. Um, and so, and that's, that's no slam or slight on the organizers. Um, you know, we have to do it at some point and this is the time we're doing it. Um, and there are opportunities in the evening to participate in other ways, but I think that's, that's a constant struggle for any of us who care about community organizing or who care about good governance is to make sure that, that we are in the spaces where people are, um, that we are um, at different tables than we normally are at, um, and that we're willing to be in uncomfortable spaces, that we're willing to feel uncomfortable and to be challenged on our own. Um, <clears throat> I want to say one other thing about advancing racial equity um, and, and just to note that there is that Proposition 2 is explicitly about that. Mm. And I appreciate that it's right up there at the top. I really do. And also feel like it's not a standalone thing, right? That advancing racial equity and inclusion is not a standalone thing that can be labeled number two and then move down to number 10. Mm -hmm. um, build new leadership. Those are integrated things and they have to be integrated. Um, that advancing racial equity has to be part of all 10 propositions from broadband down to new leadership. Yeah, I'll stop I, there and turn it over great. to Lucy. Great, thank you, Christopher. <clears throat> Lucy, what are your thoughts? Um, thanks, yeah, I will just, I'll start by saying I am a hands person. I work doing physical labor at a sawmill um, and I happen to not be working today, but, but it, is, it is a challenge and I miss a lot. And I feel sometimes limited in the leadership roles I could take on in the legislature simply because of being unavailable during normal working hours. So, mm -hmm. so we're not all <laughs> entirely head people in this room, mm -hmm. but, but it is definitely a challenge. And I would second um, Christopher's comments on that. Um, I wanted to... I think I'm not sure I have a lot to add, but I wanted to go kind of big picture back to, I think Susan started off by saying, saying power matters. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think Jameson and Christopher kind of built on that, but, but just big, big picture thinking about being a state representative and what does it mean as a state representative to be trying to shift the paradigm and hand power a little bit over, hand power over in a way that isn't mm. as typical um, in, the, in my position. And, you know, some of the things, small things, granted, that, that I've done have included simply posting on my front porch forum and in my newspaper 
when there's a contentious issue that I know will be coming up in a week or two in the legislature and saying, you know, heads up everybody, we're going to be talking about rental housing. If you own a rental property or are a tenant or are looking to buy a home, you know, you might want to pay attention. Here's what I know. Um, here's the specific pieces of feedback it would be helpful for me to have from my community. And that's small, but if people don't even know that the discussion is going on, then they can't, you know, come to the table. And I think oftentimes in state government, people can be dismissed because it feels like, oh, well, no one from your community is coming to us. So clearly they don't care that much what we do. And it's like, no, maybe they're working, maybe, you know, maybe they're taking care of their children, maybe they're taking care of their sick mother, maybe, you know, and so sometimes it's, it really has to be a two way um, interaction. And, and then the other reaction I get is people saying, well, why would you post that? Like I'm from a, I'm from a very purple district, you know, so anytime I vote on anything, 50% of my people hate the way I voted, no matter how I vote. And so it's kind of a people, you know, other colleagues from purple districts will sometimes say to me, like, why would you put that on your front porch forum? No one would even know you had taken this vote. Like if you hadn't posted it and you're just, you're just making yourself a target out there. And, and I like, I hear that, but I also feel like how, how do we, then of course people don't feel empowered if you've never even told them about the contentious votes you've taken. And, you know, if, if my community looks at the votes that I've taken is empowered to see the votes that I've taken and decides that I'm not the right representative and chooses someone else, that's a win for me because that means that I've empowered my community to choose the representative that they truly want in an informed way. And if my community is informed and chooses me to continue to be their representative, that's also a win for me in a way that them choosing me to be their representative because they didn't really know what I was doing and no one else was really, you know, didn't really care. That's not a win for me. That's me not doing my job in an effective way. So I think that's that's just the only kind of additional thought I had in listening to this. It sounds like you're using your front porch forum uh, to create one of those brave spaces where you're willing to like, let it be out there. We're gonna have, it's a controversial subject. Uh, there's gonna not be, every, everybody's not gonna get what they want, but you're just being super upfront that that's part of it. Uh, you wanna show the deliberative process to let people in when it actually could count. Uh, yeah, meeting people where they're at, which not, is what we heard. Not when it's too late to matter. Yeah, not when it's too late. We heard that uh, in uh, Christopher and Jameson made that point. Okay, so we have one, I have one other question and then we will be turning uh, over to the Q&A. We are starting to get some questions in that queue, but uh, we're gonna go in reverse order. And because this proposition number nine ends with empower new leaders, I'm curious, what do you think needs to happen to make room for new leaders? So Representative Rogers, what are you thinking? Um, I love this question and since I've been called on first, I think I'm just gonna say the, the difficult and awkward thing in the beginning to get it <laughs> out in the air, which is if we want to have space for new leaders in Vermont, sometimes older leaders need to step down. And that's, you know, that's kind of an uncomfortable and difficult thing to say. And so I'm just gonna put it out there first. And, and then, you know, from that move on to say that I think there's, there's a lot of ways to make space for new leaders, but they're even kind of hearkening back to our earlier discussion about not all communities need the same amount of work in building and rebuilding trust with government. Not all communities need the same amount of work in mentoring new leaders and also in making space for new leaders. Um, and speaking from the district that I represent, you know, I hold one of the only, if not the only, like real statewide leadership position in my district. So to me, there's a responsibility that comes with that, which is thinking about, you know, I was elected when I was 23. I benefited, I have benefited and continue to benefit personally a huge amount from the opportunity to develop leadership skills, speaking skills, communication skills, understanding state policy as someone in my 20s. Um, mm -hmm. And that's huge, but I'm also sitting here taking up, you know, currently one of the only, if not the only statewide leadership position in my entire community. And so I really do think pretty seriously about when is it time to, you know, move aside and, and let somebody else in my community have that opportunity. Um, and 
and I do think there's a balance here. Like I, you know, I, I think I'm not one of those 25 year olds who believes that if every single seat in the state legislature was held by a 25 year old new to politics, that that would be the best version of Vermont democracy. Like I do not believe that. I think the power could shift. I think the balance could shift a little bit more in that direction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that would be a direct, a step towards representational democracy, not away from it. But I think, you know, we benefit from a variety of ages. We benefit from a variety of years of experience in state government. And I'm always relying on the expertise of people who have been there longer than I have. Um, but that needs to be balanced with the recognition that we're a small state with, you know, relatively few leadership positions and some of which have been occupied for a very long time. And that doesn't leave as much space for, for new leaders to come in. So hopefully um, <laughs> the, the rest of my colleagues here can, can soften that a little bit, but that's, <laughs> that's just starting up front with kind of the, the elephant in the room thing. Great, thank you, Lucy, for giving us the elephant in the room. Uh, Christopher, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'm gonna back you up, Lucy. Um, I think you're, you're absolutely right um, that sometimes people need to take a step back, right? That, that part of creating new tables is to actually take yourself away from the table. Um, maybe not permanently, maybe not forever, um, but at least some of the time. Um, and I think that that is a key uh, factor in Vermont democracy in the small towns and in state government uh, is that too, too often it's, this, it's the same decision makers making the decisions years after year after year after year. Um, the other point that I wanna make about new leadership though is new to who exactly? Uh, and, and I'll tell the story of, uh, of my friend, um, Representative Taylor Small, right? Who suddenly kind of burst on the scene this year as a newly elected legislator from Winooski um, and made a big splash as the first out transgender representative in the state of Vermont and one of only very few um, trans elected officials in the entire country. Um, she's also quite young. Um, I think under the age of 30. Um, but Taylor has been organizing in her community for years, mm -hmm. years and years and years, uh, both in Winooski and in the Pride Center where she worked um, and in the trans community in Vermont. Um, Taylor has been doing this work for a very long time. So when she arrived in the legislature and was hailed as a new leader, that made me think, huh, new to who? Because Taylor's been a leader for a long time. Uh, and I think that's true for a lot of people who are leaders at other tables, right? Mm -hmm. Taylor's table was not the legislative table, but that doesn't mean that she wasn't a leader prior to now. Uh, so I think we really wanna think about that. What does new leadership actually mean, new to who? Great, thank you, Christopher. Jameson, what are you thinking about how to make room for new leaders? Whatever new may mean. Yes, yes. I am also gonna piggyback <laughs> off of Ms. Rogers and, and uh, you know, speak briefly about, you know, these kind of advisorships um, or mentorships or however you wanna mm. describe them to be um, when that transition is happening from individuals stepping, stepping forth or stepping back to allow somebody else to, to take their place. Um, but I also think there needs to be, you know, an embrace of intersectionalities, right? And intersectionalities in terms of how that is with environmental issues and communities of color, uh, intersectionalities within, you know, um, you know, orientation, uh, sexual orientation, and how you might, uh, you know, describe yourself to be uh, race-wise, or there's intersectionalities all around us. And I think we do too much of trying to make individual, uh, you know, arguments out of things that could be all brought together, you know, and we could be all having the same argument um, as one, as a community, rather than having separate arguments all across the board, and which leads to different tables, smaller tables, more inclusive tables, um, rather than grander, larger tables. Um, I think we need to protect our current leaders, you know, especially those of color, those in the LGBTQAA+. Um, there are too many articles, there are too many instances throughout all of Vermont um, where, you know, individuals of color and those, you know, who might not fall within the majority 
um, or quote unquote, for lack of a better term, the norm, uh, where they're not being protected, they're not being celebrated for the differences, you know? And that's where we need to be as a, you know, society when it comes to our governmental issues and, and the way we handle our government. I think it's important to establish procedures to effectively deal with these racially motivated conflicts or whatever the conflicts may, may be. Um, I think there needs to be some type of like anti-racism and, and, and equity centered culture uh, by understanding the impacts of institutional systemic and individual racism on civic engagement, trust, community connection, and democratic decision-making because it absolutely does have an impact. Uh, representation, I think needs to be diverse, uh, you know, when it comes to cultural and uh, racial uh, experiences. Um, you know, I believe local governments need to do a better job of being more accessible to immigrants and new Americans. Uh, they are a population that I don't think uh, gets enough understanding and education on what their impact uh, and their value is in their, in their new community. Uh, because they absolutely have a value um, and they absolutely have an impact in whatever community they find themselves in. Um, I think we, as a Vermont, as a whole, I think Vermont needs to acknowledge that this, this notion of tripartisan and bipartisanship, which is awesome, doesn't automatically equate to diverse thoughts and diversity in the sense of experience, um, a cultural experience, um, and things of that nature. Um, I think there needs, you know, uh, you know, just today I was reading an article in the Valley News from the town of Hartford that unfortunately, you know, in the last year there were five resignations from the select board. Uh, and some of, some of the sightings of that resignation were in terms of blatant racism. Some of it was just individuals, you know, getting other jobs and not being able to, to do, but the blatant racism, things of that nature, um, and individuals not feeling safe is something that needs to be taken very seriously. Um, you know, individuals who might, and for myself, you know, I was the first black elected official in town of Hartford. And when it came time for me to, to rerun, which unfortunately I couldn't do because I was in my third year of law school, I started having conversations with people of color who were interested in taking, uh, you know, the lead. And I had to be very bluntly honest with them about what to expect. Um, and the things that, you know, you're going to find yourself on an island where there's not going to be any out anybody out there but you. Um, and you're going to have to find a way to protect yourself. You're going to have to find a way to deal with, you know, the emails you're going to receive, the comments you're going to receive walking down the street in the town, um, you know, all these things that uh, you necessarily didn't sign up for, you know. Uh, you signed up to be somebody to be involved in the community and to represent your community as best as possible based on on uh, the, the conversations that you have with one another, not to be attacked and be called names uh, based on your race, religion, or other identifying factor, um, you know, pre prejudicially. And so uh, all these factors, I think, I think play a part and play a role. Um, and so, you know, uh, new leadership is important, but in order to get new leadership, you have to deal with these, these, these issues first. Uh, and Jameson, that's been a continuous uh, thread through all of your comments today about small towns needs more power in order to protect. Uh, and uh, so thank you for, um, keeping this idea going. Uh, leadership is a big deal and you need to, the town needs to have your back in order to take that on or the state needs to have your back. Uh, Susan, this means you have the last word on this issue. What do you think about how do we make room to empower new le leaders? This has been really, really powerful. I really, really appreciate these comments and um, I, I'm not sure I have that much new to add. Uh, the, these have been such important comments. I mean, I, I would say that um, local leaders, um, actually all of our leaders, we can all use um, training uh, and training in particular, I'm thinking about communication. Um, VCRD has a great community leadership guide uh, and the community leadership network. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, it, it, within that are just like some very simple achievable tools. Um, you know, things like if a community has a website, make sure the faces pictured on your website show the diversity of your community members. How can you be feel welcomed um, unless you see yourself um, within that uh, the, within that structure? So you know, from old timers to newcomers to loggers and lawyers and new Americans, old and young, um, you know, those are simple. Um, uh, things that we can um, do to uh, you know start to open doors. Um, training in um, uh, 
listening to understand, uh, you know, training and facilitation. Um, because, you know, we mentioned, you know, I, I thought a great idea uh, making town meetings brave spaces. I think that we need um, more meetings throughout the year uh, in our communities um, and we need to make those brave spaces. As a town moderator, I'm a little wary of relying on parliamentary procedure um, to dig into some of the, um, the, the it, with their other dialogue and deliberation tools, I think that work better um, than, town me than, than town meeting uh, parliamentary procedure would in, in uh, the kind of understanding that we need to grow. So th if we do those, the other 364 days, um, it makes the, um, the actual democratic infrastructure of town meeting um, that much more meaningful because people arrive knowing that their web of, of community um, has their back and, and that we understand each other. We have to have those kinds of conversations before we can expect uh, you know, productive uh, democratic change. Right, the other 364 days of the year, right? We need to build these skills uh, beyond Robert's rules of order. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're we have quite a number of questions that have popped up in the Q&A. Uh, Christopher is going to need to deck out, deck out soon uh, before the end of the session. So Christopher, I was going to go right to Glenn McRae's question, which is given Christopher's thought on maybe we need to create new tables to be at, how might we have organized this event or how might we be uh, or how might we invent tables for this kind of discussion going forward? We are not just replicating our standard ways of having the Vermont conversations. Christopher, do you have any thoughts before you disappear? Sure, yeah, and I'm sorry I have to leave the conversation a little bit early. I'm going into a whole other conversation about governance uh, for my organization. Um, so. Uh, you know, Glenn, I, I, it's, a, it's a fabulous question, and I think we have to look at the way the Vermont proposition has been structured as a whole, and not just at this particular moment, uh, because I actually think that during the course of the pandemic, uh, BCRD and the other organizers of, of, the, of the proposition work have learned a tremendous amount about how to reach uh, more people, how to be at different tables, how to build different tables. Um, and they have involved literally thousands of people um, from across the political spectrum and across the geographical spectrum and across the issue area uh, spectrum um, in building us to this point. Um, and this is just one pivot point in the conversation, right? It's not the end. Um, and I think that's another uh, big recognition that we don't produce a document at the end of this two-day period and then let it sit on the shelf as perhaps has happened in previous decades. Um, that it's an ongoing active process of, of building new tables, seeing new tables, being in different neighborhoods. Um, and the pandemic in some ways has really helped us with that, right? Mm -hmm. By changing the way we talk to each other. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there and, um, and say goodbye. Um, Hi, it's really nice to see you all. And I hope to see you at different tables in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're not ending the session, but uh, just saying goodbye to Christopher. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else want to take this question about uh, what it would look like to move forward? We do have other questions. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, just really quickly, if that's OK. Yeah, please do, Jameson. OK. Um, you know, I think there's a couple things that, that could be done in, in especially kind of addressing the accessibility issue, because in order to build these new tables, I think there needs to be, um, we need to, you know, combat what, what these inaccessibility um, issues may be. And so, you know, I think that there's a need to improve outreach strategies um, to reach a wider audience, mm -hmm. um, you know, address accessibility concerns by hosting events, you know, in areas that might have public transportation routes, which I know are slim in an area like Vermont, um, but those routes do exist in, in some areas. Um, you know, compensating participants, providing childcare, you know, and then like ensuring that these events are held at, at multiple dates and times and offered in multiple languages. Um, you know, uh, I, I think Lucy did an awesome job of, of letting us know that, you know, obviously not all hands and, and, and passionate thinkers can't make these mid-meetings, but 
you know, um, it's important that we keep all individuals in mind when we're setting up these meetings so we have multiple times to, for individuals to be able to come and, and be a part of the conversation. Um, I think, you know, as I talked about earlier, obviously there needs to be increase in diversity and representation throughout the entirety of the building of these tables. Um, you know, like I said earlier, meeting individuals where they are, allowing them to feel comfortable in this space. I think too often what the question is asked for, for somebody like me is, hey, Jameson, I have this great organization, this great uh, opportunity, whatever the case may be, how do I get more Black people or people of color involved, right? And I think the question there needs to be, are you prepared for them to get involved? Yeah. Right? Because once they come in that space, are you going to expect them to assimilate to what it is that you are used to and comfortable, comfortable with? Or are you going to allow them to be themselves and to be accepted rather than tolerated, right? How do we move this needle from tolerance to acceptance? And I think that is a, is a huge part of, of what we need to do with, you know, creating and building these tables. Um, you know, and, and there's this notion of like certain communities being hard to reach, right? That's kind of the notion of some of these communities. I think that is not true at all. We need to debunk some of these myths that we have been passed down from previous generations um, and really do our best to uh, infiltrate and to uh, inc incorporate ourselves in these, in these areas by having conversations uh, that are extremely inclusive and that allow individuals to, to speak their mind. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to Susan Cherry's question, uh, which is, given that the state has sanctioned local community justice centers as centers of community engagement and community involvement in the justice system, what needs to happen now in order to give permission to the average citizen to begin to feel that their voice matters and that they should get involved? Any responses about, uh, and Vermont is unusual in that we have at least 12 uh, community justice centers around the state. Uh, I'm a volunteer uh, at my local one in Brattleboro. Um, is, uh, do you see the community justice center as offering a pathway? Any thoughts on that? I think it's a great question. Uh, and maybe I, I can just take it up a, a notch. I don't, ahead, Susan. I, don't, I don't have a response to make, but I wonder if you do. <laughs> I know you're the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, well, I, I've just been really struck. Um, I got involved in the Community Justice Center because I uh, was interested in how do we help uh, people who are out, who are re-entering society. And uh, as people have been talking about, Vermont has intergenerational poverty. We have families that have been under state surveillance uh, for a long time. And I'm always thinking that wouldn't it be great for some of these, uh, for the most part, I'm working with guys who come out of Springfield. Uh, wouldn't it be great if they had a possibility to move into uh, decision-making themselves? And Vermont is exceptional, right? One of the few states where uh, you get to vote even if you have uh, been convicted of a felony. So, I, I mean, I think this question needs to, maybe it's a different panel discussion, but uh, people who have been incarcerated are ready to take on inclusivity, deliberation, and power. There's nothing like being in jail to feel like you don't have any power and all your decisions are made for you. So uh, I want, personally, so thank you, Susan Cherry. I don't know you. I did not ask for this question, but I would love to see Vermont take it up a notch and have what we call core members in COSAs uh, being able to be part of the decision-making process around corrections. So let the people be at the table who really know what uh, corrections is like. So, uh, Okay, I'm gonna move on to Howard Burroughs question. The biggest issue coming up is the word development. Does that mean growth and more and more and more? How can we work across levels of government to retain a rural feel when the new people coming here don't have that same notion of what rural feels like? Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, Lucy, I'm tempted to put you on the spot just because you, are, been, you spoke about the ruralness of your district. Um, I'm happy to be put on the spot and I, I mean this, I think about this every single day and I, I guess the, <laughs> the biggest thing that comes to mind as a comment is it's hard, <laughs> like it's really a challenge and you know I've been, I've been doing a lot, I had an intern from the University of Vermont this last, this past, this spring and 
you know, he was doing a project with me where I was having him look into gentrification, which is usually talked about in an urban context. And like, what does gentrification look like in a rural context? And, you know, it was, he's <laughs> my intern grew up in Madison, Wisconsin and lives in Burlington now. So he's never lived in a, by Vermont standards, rural, you know, location. So for him, I think it was this very kind of detached experience of doing this report. And he was sharing with me everything he learned. And I was just like getting chills the entire time he was talking because I was like, I see every single one of these phenomenon, phenomena in my community. Mm -hmm. I think the tension that's so, the tension that I'm working through, you know, is I can recognize that I live in a community that has all of these qualities of gentrification where, you know, I probably have significantly more privilege than most of the people I went to high school with and I can't buy a home in my home community, right? And mm -hmm. neither can they. And, and, and yet at the same time, I think one of the biggest threats to my community in the future is xenophobia. And so to me, there's kind of this tension that I'm working through of how do we, you know, we humans are highly intelligent species and we should be able to hold these two things and have them both be true. And work forward productively but it's really hard because either one can get reduced down in a way that is not positive for the future of a rural community and I think maybe I'll stop there and see if either of the other panelists have something to add but that's that's agreement that it's a tension it's a balance and it's an enormous challenge and it keeps me up at night every single night so I'm sorry I don't have more to add than that. Susan, did you want to pick up on that? Well, I can absolutely relate to the question uh, and, um, and to Lucy's staying up at night um, thinking about the, this tension. And it's, it's a classic, you know, what, what they call a, a polarity, um, where two uh, seemingly impossible to reconcile uh, realities um, have actually do and have to coexist. Um, and, you know, we have done that. And, and so we're talking about, um, growth and development at the same time we're talking about retaining um, what's best about our rural communities, um, which, which has so many um, great things to, 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 um, to speak for them. And, you know, polarity management always has to do with um, naming, naming what's best about both sides, but also naming the drawbacks to both sides. What happens when you have too much development? What happens when you have a community that is so uh, wonderfully rural that it, you know, devolves into, you know, an insular xenophobic, you know, uh, or, you know, community that won't change. So the pluses, you know, the great things and the negative things, recognizing them both um, and not having those diagonal conversations where I talk about what's bad about yours and good about mine, and you talk about what's you know, the, the, not those diagonal conversations, but instead na recognizing the good of both and then finding that third way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, and, and it's always gonna be a continuing, that you never solve a polarity, you just manage one and you keep on managing it. And that's what planning commissions do. And that's what town meetings do. And that's what our ongoing community conversations do, must do and must continue to do. And so that's, that's why having those democratic skills that we were talking about at the beginning is so important because we have to have those conversations in a, in a skillful way. And Vermonters, if anybody can do it, it's the state that's motto is freedom and unity, right? Mm -hmm. Because talk about a polarity and we, it's, it's our motto. So I'm, I'm hoping we can do it. I, I love this line. You don't solve a polarity, you manage it. You just have to keep going. Uh, Jameson, did you wanna weigh in on this one? Uh, sure, but really, I'll be brief with my response, but I think, you know, <clears throat> and I, you know, definitely echo uh, the sleepless nights of, of you know, Ms. Rogers and, and Ms. Clark in the sense of, you know, my term on the select board, this was a conversation, obviously, that is uh, very prominent in, you know, the local discussion. Um, and when I think of development, you know, I don't think development necessarily means more, more, more expand, 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 growth, growth, growth. I think it's more of uh, a quality of life kind of mindset, right? And so for example, when I think development, I think of the low income housing issues, right? I think of livable wages, you know, in the town of Hartford, we had an issue in terms of, we had jobs that individuals could 
we had more jobs than, than low income housing, right? And so individuals who would travel to the town of Hartford to work that job, it actually ended up costing them more to do that travel, mm -hmm. right? And so what development for me, we like, okay, public transit. What if we can develop a way for individuals to get to the town without having to spend the gas money and things of that nature, maybe find a, a sustainable, clean way of getting them there. Um, and then that could, you know, hopefully, you know, play some role in eliminating kind of the, the, the tension between low income housing and, and livable wages. Um, you know, zoning issues, I think, come up as well when it comes to development and how you're going to obviously build your community um, in the areas in which you want to, the, the land use for your community to be. Um, and I think culture is really the most important piece when it comes to like that rural life, right? In the sense of, you know, for individuals like myself who moved up here, you know, I come from uh, the state of Connecticut, which is not necessarily, you know, a, a, a large metropolitan area in, in, most, in most areas of the state. Um, but obviously I'm considered a flatlander in Vermont, correct? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I didn't come up here and want to bring all of these, you know, city type of ideas, right? I came up here because I loved rural just as much as a person who grew up here. That's the mm -hmm. reason why I chose this community. And so, though I might have ideas, you know, for instance, that might lead to, uh, you know, an increase of quality of life based on conversations, based on experiences, uh, you know, I think that should be part of the conversation, right? Because we're building this, this community together. And so the more the ideas that are on the table, the more conversations that, that, that can be had. Um, and, you know, not everything that somebody brings to the table needs to be approved or thought it's a good idea, but I think that conversation sparks other conversations. Um, and so just to be inclusive as possible with, with as many thoughts as possible. You broke up at the very end there, Jameson. So that, that do you remember what your last four words were? Oh, I'm just going to say be inclusive, inclusive as possible with as many thoughts as possible. With as many thoughts as possible. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we have a short question uh, following up on Representative Rogers' comment. What else could FPF do or offer that would better support local democracy? And if you know what FPF is, would you please tell us? Yeah, so the, the question is about Front Porch Forum. Front Porch um, Forum, which, thank you. Which has been just absolutely instrumental in getting people involved. And I'm going to be a little bit um, <laughs> snarky here, but if Front Porch Forum can figure out a way to build out internet to every home in Vermont, then that would greatly strengthen the platform. You know, I, I think in all seriousness, Front Porch Forum is amazing and in my community. I think something like you know, well over half, like two thirds or three quarters of people in my community are on Porch Forum, but not everybody has internet access. Not everybody can access it. Not everyone feels technologically comfortable accessing it. So um, I, I'm not sure I have an answer of, of anything Front Porch Forum can do that's better than it already is. It's an incredible tool. Just, I think maybe what we as users of Front Porch Forum can do is remember that it's one of the easiest ways to reach a lot of local people quickly, mm -hmm. but it isn't reaching everybody. And, um, Jason, and, and Jason added something later on in the queue, which is, it, it sounds like it can be a brave space, but or do you have any uh, ideas on how it might be more of a brave space? And anybody else want to jump in on that? Well, then, I mean, I think that From Porch Forum can be a brave space in that it can um, it can allow people to raise issues. Um, and um, but one of the things I think Front Porch Forum does so magnificently, and what it how it how critically different it is from others from social media like like Facebook, um, is that it's moderated, um, and every single message is read by a real life person, a real life Vermonter, in fact. Um, and um, we make sure that we aren't making, uh, uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's a, a civility that is maintained um, throughout. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just so critical. Um, I think what it does is, I mean, what local does best is it, it focuses like a laser on, on, on place and, and community. And community, literally, like the word community, it means commons. It's what we have in common. It's what we have in common, and that is our great strength. Um, and uh, local projects are, are usually practical and not ideologically based. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I think that's very, very important. When conversations on front porch forums start to become ideological, um, I, I support front porch forums' decision to sometimes they'll even have to shut, they'll even have to tell a town, you know what, you guys, 
go to town hall and have this conversation offline because mm -hmm. th th this isn't the medium. You know, you need a professional facilitator and you need some face-to-face -face accountability. Um, and I really respect that um, and th that they recognize th their own strengths, but also their own limitations. Wow. Uh, well, thank you so much, everybody. I mean, I think what this panel showed us is how you can uh, strengthen trust, civility, community connection, and, and you know, we didn't engage in any democratic decision making, but the connections between the panelists was really outstanding. And, uh, and when I was thinking about how we might put this together, what I was hoping is that we could model what it's like to have, to talk about the hard things, uh, to make, uh, to say things like, uh, you wanna get new leaders, the old leaders have gotta step out of the way, or to say, what does it mean to actually be a new leader? So, and then this idea that inclusivity means uh, not assimilation, but allowing everybody to change and being willing to change. So um, anyway, I'm not a professor anymore. My school closed down, but I would give you all A plus because it was an outstanding uh, conversation. People were um, really, really thoughtful in their answers. And I think you guys give me hope. So I wanna thank everybody who came out to see our great panelists. Uh, uh, I'm going to assume that you're all doing this right now or blowing kisses. Uh, and to thank you for being part of this important discussion on part nine of the proposition. And Take thank care, you everybody. Thanks for moderating. Yep, you're so welcome. Much, great to talk with you all. Thank you so much for having me. Greatly appreciate yes, it. Yes, it's great. It's great to meet you guys. All right. <laughs>